to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. Today's April 24th, 2018, and you're listening to our first Human Factors Cast ACM Kai Conference on Human Factors in Computing Systems. That's a mouthful. Bonus episode. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What's going on, everybody? How are you today? Good. And live from Kai, we have Woodrow Gustafson. How's it going, everybody? It's uh, wonderful uh, to be here from Canada. From Montreal, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. International. How, how, is, how is the weather up there? Uh, it's actually really nice right now. It's, uh, yeah, it's like 60 degrees. It's great. Um, yeah, it's, it's perfect weather. Great. Well, if you're just joining us, if you're just tuning in to Human Factors Cast because you saw the Kai 2018 hashtag, welcome to our show. We're basically going to break down uh, some of the news coming out of Kai, and Woodrow is our field correspondent out there getting the deets, the dirty, dirty deets from Kai. So, Woodrow, I'm going to go ahead and ask you, how was your day today? Oh, man, today was today was great. Um, the last two days, actually, since we didn't get to talk yesterday, right? Um, right the last right. two days have, have been uh, incredible. Um, the technology out there is is honestly mind-blowing. It's uh, I, I don't even know where to start, really. I, I had to take notes, and I, I've got to look at my notes because I'm just so flustered with... Uh, with all the cool stuff that's going on. Well, as conferences go, there's often a lot of things to cover. So why don't we just start from the top of your notes? Uh, what what did you do yesterday, and, and what kind of uh, what kind of things did you do? Conferences, people you talked to, uh, presentations, anything goes. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll go ahead and get right into it. So uh, yesterday, so um, started off with the plenary session in the morning, and happened to sit right next uh, to a gentleman who happens to uh, work for an airline company uh, doing cockpit design. Um, super interesting uh, gentleman right out of high, uh, right out of school as well. Um, and it was really fun to kind of talk to him. And uh, I am hoping to uh, get on a, uh, a call with him to see if we can get a little, uh, a little interview action with him. So that'll be kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, the yeah. plenary session itself was really cool. It was uh, actually, one of the founders of, uh, of OK Cupid. Um, and so you're, you're probably thinking right about now, what in the world does that have to do with computer human interaction? Right. Um, but it, it was really interesting because they took a very different approach, uh, as far as looking at, uh, at user data and how to visualize that and try to figure out trends. But what interests me the most about that session was, their whole concept is to actually get people off the site, right? Um, so, so we're so involved with getting people to look at our our websites and and get the users uh, involved. Uh, where this site is more involved with um, uh, getting people to join and then get off because they get matched. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, right? You you want people to be gone because that means effectively that you're um, your algorithm, your matchmaking uh, program or software has effectively been effective, right? And has matched you up with somebody else. In a way. And so what he explained is it's it's good and bad that people drop off. It's good when they actually get matched. The bad, the, the worst problem is, though, is a lot of people drop off because they didn't get a match and they got frustrated and ended up leaving but the problem was is they left without ever explaining why. And so it, it was a very interesting problem that they kept having, which was they didn't know if people leaving was a good thing or a bad thing. And uh, But their metric was they wanted people to leave. So, so it, was, it was just a really interesting way that they had to kind of figure out um, how to understand the data and how to understand how, how the interactions were working. Um, so it was, it was a really interesting talk. Yeah, that's a very different business model than probably a lot of people are used to, right? Because most of the time you're very concerned with like conversion rate. But this this is kind of cool seeing as it's conversion and then it's leaving. I mean, did they talk any about how they tried to figure out when people are leaving what's going on? Because I can imagine 
that part of a positive leave might be, you know, getting reviews or something like that or some kind of positive feedback versus none at all. Uh, so was there any kind of distinguishing marks they were able to make in their metrics? Yeah, they were. Um, they did a lot of exit. Well, they tried to do a lot of exit interviews and stuff like that. Um, you know, I mean, he was saying that. So uh, the the guy who talked um, ended up leaving a couple of years ago. Um, but he was at the time. Uh, what he was saying is that, um, that they're still getting, you know, three to four hundred emails a day. Uh, saying that they they left because they got engaged, that they're getting married, that they're updating everything like that. So in a sense, I mean, it's it's a really positive thing. But a lot of the other metrics that they were getting, a lot of the people that actually did respond um, were were just saying like they were fed up, they weren't getting the matches that they thought, they weren't getting the responses they thought. But it was funny because when they're actually showing the data, it it was kind of hilarious because it was like uh, the females were getting um mass amounts of 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 hits of messages and everything like that where the males were getting a lot less and they were looking at like age age differences of who was sending who messages and i mean it got really awkward at one point whereas like it, it was it was a pretty it was a pretty good uh you know um distinction between males and females of who was trying to message who and and all that sort of stuff so that was pretty interesting but um but yeah, that, that was just the open plenary session. So Yeah, I have a personal anecdote about the males messaging females and females messaging males. I actually met my partner uh, on OkCupid. And, um, ah. you know, it, it was funny when we met, you know, she was going through all the messages that she received. And I'm like, wow, you know, I've, I've kind of like shot. It's, it's weird. The approach that I took was kind of the shotgun approach, you know, like if they meet certain check boxes, then send them a message that's personalized, you know, and then, and then if, um, you know, those, they meet those criteria and they message back, then hopefully a dialogue is open. But from her perspective, she was getting like mass amounts of, of messages, uh, some, you know, not so great messages from some people. And, uh, you know, a lot of them, she had to kind of parse through to see which one she would respond to. And she was telling me that she didn't really go out of her way to engage with other people because she had this un- influx of, of messages. And she kind of just picked and choose from what came in rather than going out and actively seeking somebody. Yeah. And, and that's exactly, exactly what he was talking to. And one of the, the great um, things that they were looking at um, that they ended up going to was that they wanted to see kind of the response rate and, and try to figure out what what was making a good response and what was kind of creating these connections they ended up having to go to a four-way response system where basically a message was sent out and then it was replied to and then it was sent back but then it was replied to again and and the thinking behind that was so think about it this way a male sends a a request to a female right a female right might respond a lot right of thank you but i'm not interested and that's fine. That's a two-way interaction. A three-way interaction would be the male would either respond of very unnice things to say about right. them, or a very you know a very non non gentleman like response. There's a whole subreddit devoted to those responses, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure there is. But so what they want to do is try to filter those out to get to the point of when that fourth interaction, which is where she responds again, which is kind of an indication of. And then, in, then it's an actual dialogue, right? Um, the three-way is is indication of potentially it's just a threatening kind of malicious thing. But then the four-way, if she responds back, then that's actually the initiation of what they consider a um, a dialogue. And I, I thought that was just an interesting way of of looking at it and being able to figure out kind of where those breakpoints were um, in that messaging system. So I, I mean. It, at first, when I came into it, I was very biased. I thought, uh, that, what is this really going to have to do with anything? But it, it turned out really fascinating. Um, so I was really I was really pleased. Yeah, I'm actually really jealous that you got to go to that. But I'm happy that you're here able to report on it so that everyone <laughs> who wasn't there, who wasn't able to attend, uh, could, could kind of get an idea of that. So that was the plenary session. Yeah. Um, wh- yeah. What else happened? So, so, yeah, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, so, so... One of the the really really cool talks, and it was the the basically the the first uh, section of talks, um, 
was about, and it was called uh, Two Kinds of Multi-User Immersive Display Systems. Um, and, and basically what that means is they wanted to try to figure out a way to uh, use um, a, a VR system, well, not a VR system, but a, a 3D um, uh, system for multiple users to view different objects. So... Um, it's, it, it probably sounds really strange. So let, let me just uh, tell you basically kind of how it works. So you have two different users, right? And they're viewing one screen, but the way they have it set up is they have uh, two to three different projectors going at the same time that are displaying different um, uh, types of information. And depending on the glasses that you have, the 3D glasses, they have different filters. Ah, I and see. And so, yes. And so what they were showing was absolutely fantastic um, in that they were basically saying, they are basically showing two different uh, uh, views or movies or, or uh, 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 concepts and people that had different lenses were viewing completely different things. So thinking about some application for this type of technology, right, is sometimes there, at least in a military setting, you have um, several different representatives from several different nations looking at uh, some sort of interface. And now I'm, I'm thinking like off in the future, augmented reality, let's say there's some information uh, projected on a, on, a, on a wall somewhere, um, or, you know, they're wearing these glasses and some information would be presented to uh, some people and some information would be projected to some other people. So that way some people get the full picture. Some people get partial the part of the picture, depending on, um, their classification, the classification of, of the objects in the virtual world. And that way it's, it's, uh, linked back to the headset or, um, you know, they're, they're using projectors in, in the case that you're describing here, Woodrow, but, uh, I, I can very well see applications at least for the concept being used in that type of setting. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's 100%. Um, that's exactly kind of what was going through my mind when I was watching this is different levels of may maybe not classification, but just privacy, right? Um, right? If you're you're showing information to a group of people, but you only want a, a certain group of people to see certain information and uh, others different information, you can effectively have them in the same room, uh, if you will, but have them see different things. Um, and one of the examples that they had, which I thought was really cool, which uh, was kind of a um, an example from games, was they were having people play tennis. And uh, basically, each uh, the different players had their own view of the tennis match uh, from a, a, a virtual reality perspective. And so you can think of if you ever played like Wii Tennis or something like that, right? You, you, you hit the ball and then you watch it go over and then you see the other player like come into action and they can hit the ball. Well, this is basically essentially taking that but dividing it out into where each player has their own perspective on that actual game playing back and forth. Now, what does this look like from the outside with no equipment? Is it just like two overlaid images that um, yeah. like when you look at a, a, a 3D movie without the polarized lenses on, you kind of see the two images side by side um, and it just looks like this overlaid image. That's what. It... Yeah, it, it's like that and times two uh, because it's okay. two of those images, right? Overlaid on top of each other. So you, so they were showing it, and you literally really could not make out a damn thing. That I mean, was, it was like, or, or you know, you can make out like some sort of images, but it was like you were looking at, it and you're like, uh, I think that might be a bear or a castle. I, I don't really know. Right. So um, it, it reminds <laughs> it reminds me kind of like the old days when you would like channel surf uh, through the channels and hit one of those HBO or Showtime or something, <laughs> and everything's all scrambled because you don't have yeah. access to it. Yeah, but you'd still try to make it out, right? You're still yeah. like hoping that you'd see just like something a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was like that. But but so um, to, to to take a more uh, realistic approach, though, and and this is something I, I I actually wrote down because I thought this would be a, a fantastic implementation of this product. Um, movies. So you go to a movie, right? A movie theater. The reason they're so expensive is they're so big. And you can only see one movie at a time, right? Right. A 
imagine, imagine if you had a movie theater that every person can choose the different type of movie they wanted to see and say you, you have two or three different movies within one within one thing you could sell that thing out every single time charge less and everyone would get exactly what they wanted um yeah there's a few so like i i, I those can of applications I can already throw a wrench into the movie idea, right? Because if you're, if you're watching two movies at the same time, it could be disruptive if one movie ends before the other one and people get up and leave. Or if there's like a funny moment or a scary moment in another movie and you see people react around you to something else, right? But you're like, wait, nothing there. I don't know. I, I, I see where you're going with it. And if people go in with that expectation, it could be mitigated. But like I, uh, I see personally, I see a lot more... Um, sort of uh application for things like esports where uh maybe maybe the commentators or the people who are uh narrating the events are able to see things that the players are not or that the um that the audience members are not uh you know that type of thing i don't know I, there's a lot of different applications but I, I my mind goes straight to virtual environments and video games yeah. yeah, I see like yep. a big kind of uh, implication for just sports watching in general, right? Because if you have referees like for MMA, for argument's sake, if they're watching from different angles, like you're talking about Woodrow from like the right, left and center parts of the cage, you could see different elements of fights and pick out different parts and maybe scoring would be better based off of that. So I see like a lot of implications for that. But even pulling it in from film, I mean, if you're filming uh, like uh, one set, one film from these kind of three angles or as many as you need, even integrating this kind of technology that would allow people to see from multiple angles into one as your head moves could give you that 3D or that 360 degree view that they talk about potentially implementing in VR film. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, and the last thing, the last little note I wrote on, um, because I'm, I'm, I, I thought it would just be, be kind of interesting is, um, which I feel like a lot of us probably deal with is, uh, I, I don't know if you guys have this problem, but, um, you know, occasionally when you're trying to browse for Netflix, options with with your significant other oh yeah um <laughs> you, you might disagree or or you might want to watch something that they don't want to watch right um so so i can only imagine that taking this into the home could be something that could be really really cool where y you might need to have like uh you know headphones on but you you could be in the room with them so you're still kind of low co-located but you could be watching different programs on the exact same screen this might um, this might finally be the uh, the way I get to do that because I've often suggested that we have two TVs right next to each other so, so we could do exactly that. <laughs> we always disagree on what to do. Yeah, and and you could just imagine you know the possibilities of this kind of uh, the technology. Um, so yeah, it, it it was it was just incredible watching this this um, uh, this presentation and, and just my mind just kind of just started going off like crazy. Um, thinking about the possibilities. Yeah. So, so what else uh, did you get to? We're still on day one, yeah. I I know, man. That's why I was just looking at my notes. I was like, all right, now I got to turn the page. Um, we're we're good. Um, so uh, <laughs> another. <laughs> um, so uh, the next thing, um, and, and this isn't going to be as long, but um, I I thought this was a really really interesting talk. Um, so a lot of us, or or at least you know, um. Uh, the few of us that have uh, gotten the experience to go to VR, um, try different things out, right, in, in VR and stuff, someone posed the question of, you know, what happens? What, what's your experience when you exit VR? Oh. Uh, what is, right? And, and that got me thinking, oh, man, I, I never thought about kind of what that experience was, right? Um, what do people think? Do the people automatically know that they're in the real world? Um, and, and the interesting thing uh, that they brought up is that this is also a very, very small window of time. I mean, we can, I mean, this is probably seconds, right? Potentially between when you're, when you're done in VR and when you're, when you take the, the goggles off or whatever, and you're in the real world. Yet it's extremely important as far as a cognitive processing to understand where you're at, your location, understand physically and everything where you're at. Um, and, and so it just it's just a very interesting thought um, as far as, you know, 
what goes on with that kind of transition from this virtual world to the real world. Um, and, and so the, the talk was just fascinating. It was just, it, it's something that you, you would rarely kind of, you would kind of second guess or just kind of look over, but um, they really took the time to kind of think about. Yeah, I'd be curious um, to see what exactly that presentation was because uh, I've often thought about that as someone who studies VR and um, that that moment when you leave VR for the first time, it's almost the same disorientation that you get as oh. when you are hopping into the environment, right? You, when you hop in, you're like, wow, this is new. This is novel. I'm in a completely different place. And then when you take it off, it's the same experience. Wow, this is different from where I just was. It's familiar. Where am I, right? Especially if you go into a virtual environment in which you move in the physical space and it is mapped to the virtual mm-hmm. environment um there yep. there's a lot of disorientation when that happens because then you're pulled out and potentially in a different place yes and and they address that exact issue which i thought was fantastic right so uh the way they they did this was they had a they had a room i think it was like a nine by nine or ten by ten room that had you know furnishings and stuff so it had a couch it had a few uh, pictures on the wall and and stuff like that, right? So they could kind of visually orient themselves to where they were at spatially in the room. So in the virtual world, what they had was um, they started off normal, but they ended up increasing uh, the so the virtual world actually replicated the physical world. Mm, okay, but but what they did um, throughout the study, and it was like ten or fifteen minutes long while they're in this virtual world. They increased the the um, I don't know how to put it the the amount of moving that you did. So they so when you might think that you might have taken uh, you know a, a five feet uh, worth of steps, you really took like seven. Right. And then if you turn like ninety degrees, it actually might have turned like like uh, uh, you know one hundred and twenty degrees. So they adjusted the gain to mess with your proprioception. Exactly. So, so what they did is at the end of the study, what they showed was you were, you started off in this, uh, like bottom left corner of the room, but when you ended up physically, you were in the top right of the room. So the exact opposite of the room, but in the virtual world, you still thought you were in that exact same starting position. Oh, wow. And, and so when people came out, they had this expectation of, oh yes, I'm in this particular corner there's this particular picture that I'm right in front of and they would come out and they were in a completely different part of the room. And they said that basically the, everybody that came out was just kind of freaking out, like completely disoriented, like just like, Holy crap, how did I get here? Kind of thing. Um, it, it was just really cool. Um, just because of that manipulation of you can totally, um, change how people think and how they're, their uh, perception of, of spaces. Yeah. Which is really intense when it comes to VR, right? Because you have, like I imagine these exit strategies of VR, you have a lot of context you could be ten- potentially dealing with. I mean, ranging from anything as simple to leaving a video game to the like more extreme case of being like in the operating room as somebody operating, you know, with a VR headset on, like using, you know, robotic surgery tools or stuff like that and so those those exit strategies and being oriented is going to change the needs going to change across whatever context it's in but i i think it's amazing that they were able to you know create that sense that you're in a complete you thought you were in a completely different part of the room where you end up and you're like whoa this is this is not where i thought i was i think that's kind of incredible in itself yeah absolutely um yeah, it, it was it was really cool. How they did it, I don't know. I'm sure there was a lot of math and and physics involved with with figuring out how much they had to increase the gain and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it was really cool. Okay, so day one was that was that the end of day one? How much more do we have of day one? Uh, how much do you want? Um, so, well, so, why, why don't you give uh, me just real- why don't you give me one more from day one? And then uh, we'll we'll jump into day two. We'll we'll do about a half an hour per day. How about that? All right, that sounds good. Um, then I will have to leave with uh, which, unfortunately, is probably the coolest part. So we might have to do a, a bonus bonus section. Bonus on this. bonus. 
Um, <laughs> it's okay. Let's let's tr- let's let's give it the attention it deserves. And and you know if we if we run out of time or uh, potentially we can go long, we'll see how we're feeling. We j- I just want to make sure we give everything its due time and we talk it through um, because I think our listeners do deserve to kind of hear what's going on. And I don't think you know we should shortchange them about you know p- some of the potential of of the things that you went to. So let's just talk Absolutely. about it. Absolutely. It, well, like I said, so so I think I, I sent you an email or something, or oh, maybe I was talking to um, to my wife. But um, the the first day actually was about a twelve hour day. Um, so so that gives you that gives you an idea, and all the all the listeners an idea of how long and how intense and how visually stimulating and draining it was. Oh yeah, if um, we have so uh... so that that's why that's why talking about this in thirty minutes is is extremely difficult. Of, oh compounding all that information into into a little bit but uh, i will get right to it so the the main thing that i wanted to to hit on was the uh reception and demo uh at the end of the night um so so it was a basically a three to four hour kind of reception at the end it was basically a, a welcome reception they had all the demos there um of all the technologies um and everything like that uh i i i to describe it is just like it's it's impossible it's like it's like describing what a unicorn looks like right um everything you could possibly think of uh was there as far as technology wise um and i'm talking uh uh bit drone bit drones uh where they have and they have drones that are basically swarms of drones so you think of like think of like 15 drones right mini drones that all work in in sequence in sequence and you can overtake one drone any any one you want you can overtake one manipulate that one and all the rest of them follow that action of that one drone that is so intense i can't wow. even imagine seeing that in person uh, yeah yes so so i have a video um i took a video about almost about a minute long video of of this this demonstration um, and so I'll, I'll send it to you and we can post it on the, on the Slack. Yeah. Why don't you go um, ahead and just post it directly into the Slack? Yeah. I, I'll see if I can do that here with the Wi-Fi. If not, I can oh, do sure. that when I get back. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll definitely post it either but, way. But it, it, it was just incredible to watch. I mean, it, it was, and not only that, but it was, um, it, they could also manipulate it to where they were not only, um, at the same level on the the z axis so so um height wise but they could also manipulate it to where uh you could take one and and uh br- and drop it down while the others stayed in the same place um and so you could create kind of these uniform these kind of shapes with these drones by taking one uh by itself and manipulating it so it didn't uh change all the other drones at the same time um, it, it, I know it's very hard to explain. You'll, you'll watch in the video and, and you'll understand, but just the implications of this, you can, you can just imagine, uh, what you could do with this as far as creating and, and oh, and the, the, the crazy thing about it is they had LEDs attached to them that were on a color spectrum. So depending on their height, they had different colors. And so you can imagine for shows, for light shows, for any sort of visual, stimulus you could make these incredible shows with these drones of just enormous proportions right with with the basically by um anything you wanted to do it it was just it it was just incredible so this this reminds me of the uh halftime show at the super bowl uh with all the drones making the thing behind the scenes Is, is that kind of the same technology there yeah, I, I believe it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and, and but, but seen it in person was just incredible. Um, oh yeah, but yeah. I, I do. I do believe it was the same kind of technology. It's a completely different thing to witness it in person. I'm sure. I'm now. I'm more curious about what this means for the human operator of these drones. I mean, there's a lot of human factors issues with trying to control swarms and and switching modes and and taking control of just one drone and pulling it out and having it do its own thing and having the swarm follow or having it do its own thing and having the swarm maintain their current behavior. There's a lot of sort of human factors issues for the controls of these things. And I'm wondering, did you get a chance to look at what they were using to control these things? 
Yes, I did. And it, it was really interesting the way they did this. So that what they did, and, and I didn't get to see it up close, but it was basically they had these, um, uh, these uh, things, these um, straps on their hands. So I'm guessing they had some sort of uh, chip RFID uh, implementation in their in these straps that they had on their hands, right? And so you can imagine these kind of 15, 16 drones kind of floating in the air. And if, if what they did was if they put their hand over on the, on the top of the drone, all of them would kind of light up a little bit brighter. And then they, and that basically synced all of them up to where they would all move in, in synchronous, right? So then you could take that, physically grab it, move it in space and it would all move all the drones. That's okay? interesting. So they were using gestural based commands for controlling the swarm. Yes. But if they only wanted to move one, they just had to, to approach it from either the side or underneath and it wouldn't sink all of the other ones. And you could li- and you could just grab that one and manipulate it without moving the entire, uh, the entire swarm. So that's an interesting approach, and that that would work fine if you had uh, access to drones up close. But I'm wondering, you know, there's got to be another sort of input method for controlling these things remotely. I'd be curious to see what that is as well, Um, because, you know, being close to a drone, you're not always going to be close to a drone when you're controlling these things. I can think of uh, like like military applications or even commercial now that we're seeing a lot more uh, commercial applications. bringing drones into um, everyday life and, you know, doing deliveries and, and even data collection. So uh, curious as to how they, they uh, tackled that challenge. Yeah, I, I think so. When they got them started, they put them in this, in this room and it was actually caged off because literally one went rogue and, uh, and started <laughs> flying all around. I, I'm not even joking. I wish I had it on camera, but it started flying all around and ended up crashing and breaking. Um, oh, it was it was goodness. really cool. yeah, it was really cool to see. But a little <laughs> knowing that technology, like even the guy w- that was in there, was like, I don't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden, just, zoo, 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 zoo. I was like, oh, <laughs> all right. Well, then uh, I don't know. But were anyways, there, were there any but, talks about the rise of AI and and uh, no, taking I, over? <laughs> Um, but, but no, to, to start them off, they actually had a, a program officer, uh, that started them all off and got them, got them started in a position and everything like that. So they, I think they do have a, uh, a computer program that actually, um, had all that stuff kind of, um, uh, able to control them as well. So very cool. Very cool. So what other demos did you see? Um, all right. So um, some of the other ones that were really note noteworthy, um, they had an asteroid game. Um, if and I'm gonna kind of uh, uh, see if anyone actually remembers this from from back in the day, asteroids where you know you had you had that little spacecraft and you shot the little asteroids that came at you and you kind of had to swivel and all that sort of stuff, right? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, so we all know that. Well, we know that. Maybe some of the younger listeners might not understand that. If not, YouTube it. It's a fantastic game, greatest game. They actually implemented this right with uh, um, on a on a large display. So so they actually had it um, to where it, it was this like ten foot by ten foot square area uh, that they had squared off, and. They projecting these asteroids down onto this this floor and what they did was that they had somebody um go onto one of those uh bouncy balls so you know the ones that have like the little handles that you can like uh (laughs) yes right you know exactly what i'm talking about right i think a few people use those as office chairs (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) so they they had people get on that and they put this helmet on that had sensors in it to where wherever you looked, when you jumped up, it it shot one of the one of the the bullets. That's so cool. So, so what you had to do was when when everything started, you basically had to start bouncing up and down and and moving and looking where the targets were coming uh, on the floor, and based on where your head rotation was, it was shooting the 
the uh, the bullets and and destroying the asteroids. That is a true example of multimodal interaction. Yeah, it, it, it was so cool to, to see. I mean, just and and the scale of it was just incredible. Like, I mean, you know, it was this massive thing. They had uh, cameras everywhere and 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 cables and everything like that. But it, it was a wireless head head unit. Um, but it was just cool to see on a massive scale being able to do this kind of this kind of interaction and, and gamification gaming kind of thing. So. Well, uh, why don't you rattle off a couple more, and we'll kind of pick one of those to talk about. And then if our listeners have any questions, they can visit you in our Slack. And just to kind of remind everyone, uh, we we often pick up a lot of new listeners on these um, bonus episodes. So if you're just joining us, we do have a listener facer, facing Slack. You can visit us over there. Our link is in the show notes. Um, or Yeah, and, and uh, we do post a lot of links to the stories that we talk about on the show, as well as uh, have some of our our guest hosts in there as well. And they, they can uh, talk about the content that you hear about on these bonus episodes. Uh, so Woodrow, you're going to be posting uh, the, the drone video as well as um, you know, you, you're, you're available to talk about some of these other topics that you're about to rattle off. Absolutely. So, all right, so I'll just start rattling them off. Uh, there was a, a mathematics teaching uh, experience with HoloLens uh, from MIT Labs, you can imagine the quality that came out of that. Uh, there was um, uh, a a uh, a chair that was um, uh, oh gosh, I don't know how to I don't know how to describe it. it was a um, multi axi chair that uh, um, moved while you were watching a video. Um, so so it was it was kind of that if you've ever been in one of those uh, movies that have the um motion simulators uh, yes thank you um god the the word was <laughs> was escaping me i apologize but they had one of those um that was going through a full simulation of this kind of video game thing um that was just incredible but they also had a, a, a smaller version of it which was just basically a seat pad but they were using that to kind of simulate the motion as well um for for a fraction of of what the the full uh, chair was cost basically, um, uh, what else? Uh, there was um, uh, th- there was a a really cool demonstration of how um, this uh, device allowed you to interact on your uh, so so it was uh, it was kind of like a wristwatch, but it allowed you to it projected something on your your forearm to where you could interact with it. Um, so kind of like the virtual keyboards, uh, if you will. Um, oh, yeah. but it was a, a, a wristwatch that allowed you to actually interact with it on your forearm. Um, that, was that it like was, interacting with other elements of the wristwatch, but having them displayed on your forearm or was it completely something different? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was kind of like that, um, to where it was, uh, you, you could look on your wristwatch and then what was being projected, um, you could kind of uh, manipulate kind of what you were seeing on there or like or uh, changing kind of the settings or something like that. Um, it, it was just it was just really cool. And then uh, nice, what, yeah. what else you got over there? Oh, man. Um, I know there was, there's, of- there's probably a lot, but like hit two or three more highlights and then I think we can go ahead and move on to day two. Um, yeah, so there was, uh, let's see. So I'm trying to think of, oh, um, one of the cool things was, uh, it, it seems kind of small, but they, they basically created these, um, uh, this system to, uh, link up, um, basically mobile workstations for, uh, like tablets, right? So you can imagine, um, uh, using multiple tablets and being able to kind of like, um, link them together. But, but they, it, it was basically using 3D printed uh, little objects that you could kind of connect multiple uh, of these tablets together to make different, different forms of displays. So you could have like two tablets side by side. You could have three tablets kind of um, one on the one on the one flat, one at like a 45 and then one straight up. Um, so different angles uh, and everything like that. So you could create a completely customized 
um, display using uh, a different number of tablets. Um, and it was a very simple concept, but uh, it was just a really cool application for how you can use multiple devices. Um, uh, let's see. Um, oh, man. Uh, one more. One more. <laughs> if you had to pick okay. one more. I know. I'm trying to. I'm trying to think about it. I know. Um, there's. There's really so much, and there are so many demos. And I know you posted those videos in our Slack channel. So if any of our listeners have any questions about those demos, maybe they can ping you in our Slack and and see if you saw them, um, and and maybe get your eyewitness report, if you will. Uh, so um, let's go ahead and move on to day two, though. If you, if any of our listeners have any questions, I'm sure they can approach you in Slack and 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 definitely get answers. But um, that that sounds like a pretty packed day. I can't even imagine what day two is. Was day two longer? Uh, no, thank God. Um, <laughs> no twelve hour day I, round two. Yeah, I pretty much like uh, after after that that session, I I literally came home, uh, grabbed a bite to eat and then went straight to bed. Um, it, it was pretty exhausting, but, but day two, uh, definitely delivered, um, just as well. So, um, I'll get right into it. Um, one of the highlights was, uh, it, what they called David and Goliath, um, which I thought was a clever title and it was smart watches, uh, with large displays. Oh, so it was okay. basically, so what they did was they used these large displays and they they implemented it with using a smartwatch to use that for uh, interacting with it. And so you'd have these large scale data to look at um, some sort of information, but then you would use a smartwatch to kind of look at different views of it. And so um, I think what they used was crime statistics in Baltimore. But what they were showing was on these large displays all these different types of crimes, all these different years, um, you know, you can imagine all the, the data analytics behind it. But what they would do is they would use their watch basically as a remote. And so they would say, oh, I want to look at kind of this statistic and this statistic. They would push it to their, their smartwatch, okay? And then what they would do is they would go to a different uh, graph or different visualization, and they would say, all right, now from this statistic, show me uh, the, those two specific uh data items that i'd push to my watch say uh uh murders and burglary i want to now see it in this kind of visualization and so they push it from their watch to the large display and it would show just the just those two um those two data types okay um yeah and it's it's, it's kind of a little bit hard to explain but once you watch it um and, and see it uh it, it was just fantastic because it was basically using a smartwatch to interact with this large display. And so that way you could kind of step back and, and view the, I mean, cause we're talking large displays. We're not talking 27 inch monitor, right? We're talking, we're talking a hundred inch, uh, LCD led screen. Right. Um, so, so, I mean, these are very, very large displays. And so they could step back, see it at a glance, get a great essay of everything that's going on and then step in and kind of, manipulate on their smartwatch what they wanted to see in more detail uh in certain areas um we're living in the future that sounds very futuristic to me because i mean like you know it's it's like one of those things like beep beep boop toss it up on the screen you know (laughs) or like computer show me these statistics and you know you're doing it from your smart watch we have we are living in a world with smart watches and that still strikes me as crazy so (laughs) that we're finding some use for them is amazing because I often find smartwatches to be very gimmicky and apps and applications are not designed uh, very well, or at least I haven't had the experience of, of um, you know, there's a lot of porting that happens, right? They they design an mm-hmm. app and then they kind of port it over to the smartwatch the best they can, and nothing's really designed from the ground up for this. But this type of application sounds like it's exactly that they are designing this smartwatch application to be used in tandem with these large displays so that way you can manipulate data uh, from a control on your personal body and manipulate something that's out there in the environment and that's intriguing to me yeah and and another aspect that they went into that i thought was really interesting was think of it this way large displays are very public um, the information is is typically obviously 
most a lot of people can see, especially around. But the information on your smartwatch can potentially be very private. Um, you can have personal data and everything like that. And so they were going into basically how you can uh, make sure that what you're displaying is, is, is only public data, but everything that stays on your watch um, that's private data stays on there. And so it, it was just a, a very interesting way of thinking about kind of displays and the difference between public and private data. Um, which for me I thought was was really interesting because I, I'm I'm really getting into kind of that whole privacy area um, and, and that brought up a whole new kind of kind of interesting topic I thought. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about how that would play out though, because I mean what you described first was the the idea of taking a large data set, looking at your smart device, and being able to filter it down and do some kind of different visualization or different analysis based on it and then push it back to the big screen. I'm wondering how that would change based off of if you want to keep something private to yourself or when the instance is that you want to keep that data or that information only for you, like how all those kind of small interactions work. But it's a, it's a really cool concept. Um, and Nick's right. I hope, I wonder if this is going to kind of spur the, the need or the ability to design, you know, interfaces for, for the watch, especially with the bigger face that you were talking about, um, t that are more optimized for that kind of experience. Cause it sounds like to do any of what you're describing, you couldn't, you can't really not tailor to the design, especially if you're, if you're like manipulating data and then sending it back somewhere based on a visualization you create. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was pretty incredible. I think they used the, uh, the Samsung gear, uh, S three. So it was a, it was a commercially, uh, available product and, it, it was incredible. Obviously, it's, it's limited in what it can do in the display screen and everything like that. But what they were able to do uh, was pretty pretty incredible as far as how they were able to, sh to show the data that they pushed to the watch and, and being able to choose what they wanted to push back to the display um, what was pretty cool. So, um, now, so yeah. That, that... Quick question. Was this, was this a demo that you attended or was this a talk that demoed it during the talk? This was a this was a paper. Oh, okay, all right. Um, so, so the, yeah, so the, they showed a few small uh, uh, video screen uh, video caps uh, during their presentation, um, but yeah, this this was a uh, a university paper, I believe. So, very cool. All right, so what was up next? Um, so I will I will go ahead and live up to my re reputation as uh, as Ergo, Ergo Boy, Boy Wonder. Wonder. Um, <laughs> And uh, this this concept, and I believe it's called um, active active ergo uh, or adaptive ergo. I, I can't quite remember the name of it, but it was really really interesting. Um, basically, uh, what they did is they they created a a um, a system using a an Xbox Connect that when you approached it, um, you, you approached it, it looked at your body mechanics, your size, um, your limbs, everything like that. It measured everything. You did like one or two different poses um, just so that they could get angles and everything like that. And, and uh, for like, um, for uh, positions. And then the the workstation, so we're talking the monitor, the desk, and the seat itself actually changed based on your body mechanics, um, based on your your um, measurements. It had changed to the proper uh, ergonomically designed recommendations for you. Um, so this is which, bad. This is bad news for people for companies who hire individuals to do exactly this. Uh, because now they are out of a job. <laughs> well, uh, that is true, except for the <laughs> fact that I, I, I wanted to ask him how much this system costs. Oh, yeah. No, I'm sure it costs a ton. Uh, I'm sure it costs <laughs> it, uh, quite a bit of money. Um, I, w I was just looking at, at what their demo was. I mean, everything had to be um, completely uh, mechanized, um, including the... Uh, 
you know the angle of the, the monitor. monitor the monitor heights the angles the the desk had to be the the even the seat had to be incorporated with sensors to uh, manipulate height um, and to be able to adjust accordingly um, and so yeah I, I can imagine that this would be uh, extremely expensive but what I was thinking is that this could be a really cool application if you can get it to actually uh, provide uh, alternatives for a variation of uh, body positions. Okay. So one one of the key one of the key things in ergonomics and especially even like these standing desks or anything like that is changing your body position so that none of your muscles really get to that fatigue state. So even while you're sitting, you should be kind of changing your your body position, everything like that, um, just so that your muscles all, you know, get a different, get a different uh, um, load and everything like that. But c- can you imagine that? Um, and you know, there's a lot of apps out there that say to, you know, like, oh, it's been 20 minutes. Look, 20, 20 feet away for 20 seconds, right? Um, and all that sort of stuff. We, we all know those metrics, right? Who really pays attention to that? What if that wasn't in your control? What if every 45 minutes, every hour, your desk literally changed positions? So you had to stand up. You had to, you know, take different positions as far as how you actually worked with your workstation. Um, and, and that was running through my mind the whole time where I thought, holy cow, this actually could have huge impacts for uh, workstations, for for these uh for being able to like have a truly adaptive workstation um, really got me kind of excited. Introducing the future. You can have it for just two ninety nine ninety nine ninety nine. dollars Like, yeah, I, the cost would be prohibitive, but you're right. I mean, this does, this would have huge implications for uh, workstations and kind of how we approach the way we interact with, the technology that's in front of us, meaning computer screens, right? If if instead of a Fitbit saying get up every couple of minutes, uh, you know, it, it's it's the desk physically changing to alter your posture so that you have to adjust. I think that's a great way to passively encourage, you know, some of these um, some of these behaviors that will be better for your uh, posture. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think maybe you know down the road, and I'm talking ten. 20 years down the road it might it might end up getting um getting implemented in some fashion obviously it's it's nowhere near um cost cost effective to do this but just the technology itself was just really fascinating to see what the possibilities were and the fact that they were able to just do this off using a simple connect um they didn't have to have fancy machines or anything like that they could use something that's commercially available obviously the algorithm and everything like that um, and all the sensors and, and mechanics uh, was pretty complex, but uh, you know, j- just seeing this sort of stuff is just is pretty mind blowing um, to me. So, right. So, uh, what else we got up for today? Okay. So Open let's see notes. here. Um, all right. So I am going to uh, actually touch on uh, something that I know uh, Blake will really enjoy. Well, I don't know. I don't know how you're gonna beat the like desk that just adjusts itself because that thing sounds amazing. So I'm excited for what this is gonna be. Um. Well, how about how about location based smart contracts using blockchain technology within smart cities? <laughs> That's awesome. Wait, hang on. Oh, say, say, break that down one more time. Say it, but slower. Location based smart contracts for smart cities. Okay. Explain. All right. So, yes, get ready to, to smile till your till your face hurts there, Blake. Um, <laughs> seriously, man, th- this talk was like, it, it was so, so cool. And I could tell that, like, the majority of people, I, I felt like, I don't know, the, 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 the feeling in the room was like, there were the people that you could tell were just, like, fascinated by this concept. And there were people that were just, super skeptic and i feel like that's kind of the norm for this kind of blockchain technology but the way they went about this is that they they created these this smart contract based on the ethereum 
uh, uh, network, right? And what they did was that they they created these smart contracts to be able to allow people to explore cities um, to create these what they call uh, uh, geo coins. So geo coin is is a is a um, uh, a cryptocurrency. Um, but but what they did is that they, they they basically use it as a, a Pokemon Go type um, hmm. application, if you will. So so the way they tested this is that they went around this city, and I, I don't know what city they, it was. They didn't they didn't specify, but they, they sprinkled, as they said, um, geo coins all over this city, right? And so what people had to do is they had to use their smartphones and this app to go around and try to find these geo coins for rewards. And so these rewards were basically, um, if, if you're in, if you're within this specific G, GPS location, you get a credit towards your account. But if you're in this, in this other location, you might get a debit on your account. And so it's, it's, it's really hard to explain kind of, <laughs> over, over, I, I know you guys are probably scratching your heads and I'm, I'm sorry, man. I'm I, in my head. I'm like thinking of this incredible thing, but no, I, just, think I, I think I understand a little bit of what's going on. I mean, so are these geo coins they're creating kind of specific to the town? Like it's, you're only collecting them in this specific area of the town and it adds them to some, some kind of Ethereum level Bitcoin type, um, just inter, uh, uh cash type flow that you're earning as you go through the town so it's kind of that same thing of mining bitcoin but this time you're moving through an actual city yes exactly except so so yes and and what you can think about it as is is think about it this way if you uh think about ways right so ways the 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 app ways um kind of uh controls traffic right on if this highway is particularly busy, they might route some of the some of the users this way to kind of reroute traffic and make sure it's it's flowing properly, right? So this, what they were basically saying is that this concept could have that same potential for touristy type uh, cities. And so what you could do is say for these less popular attractions. So so let's take. Um, like Paris, for example, right? Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower, right? Arc de Triomphe, um, the Louvre, all these kind of like very, very well-known, very popular, extremely populated um, attractions, you're actually going to get hit with a debit. Because if you want to go to these locations, you're going to pay to see this, right? I don't like that. (laughs) Well, hold on, hold on. Okay, but what I'm if listening. you wanted to kind of see the the more uh, cultural uh, artifacts behind the city? What if you wanted to see these kind of lesser known um, cultural acts, aspects that really highlight what the culture is really about, not just what you see on TV, what you see in movies, um, everything like that, what you see in Hollywood, right? Then, then what you do is is you incentivize them. How do you incentivize people? Money. And so what they what they were what they were conceptualizing is you you provide people with the incentive of finding these geo coins in these less less populated areas, and so then that way they explore a little bit more of the city, a little bit more of the richness of the culture, while also kind of and, and l- let me get this l- let me put this out there we're, we're not talking like tens of dollars anything like that right we're, we're talking like like pennies and stuff like that. Right. But it's just this kind of incentive to, to explore these other areas that people, most people might not explore. They might not understand the culture um, or, or they might not realize, um, you know, the, these different things. I think this is a super cool concept. And I think the intentions are in the right place. I just don't see, like, what's going to stop me from disabling my location data when I visit the Eiffel Tower and then maybe look at my app and see, oh, if I go over to these places, I get credit. And, you know, just like abuse of the app, right? I think yeah. I think that's a cool sort of um, uh, philosophical type of application, but I can 
I can see this being used in a variety of other ways that could potentially have more benefits to the city itself, right? So, like, what if you use this as kind of a way to capture information about the city? Let's say there are places in the city where maintenance needs to be done, and they need some data collection on it. So you go over to the site, you snap the site, you get one of these uh, little rewards, right? I can see that as being a much better use of this technology, especially for... um, uh, like these areas that maybe people don't visit that need maintenance, like there's a pothole or something, and there's like a report of a pothole in that area, but we don't have the funds to send somebody out, but we do have a couple cents to credit to your account. Why don't you go over there, take a snap, and send it in to us, and we'll give you like half of a cryptocurrency thing. I uh, uh, I I feel like you're looking at my notes. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not at no. all. <laughs> Are, are you sure, man? Like, I swear, I'm not cheating so, on the exam. <laughs> so, so they address that exact thing, which is one of the major limitations of this technology, um, wh- which is exactly that. How can they limit people from disabling geolocation on their phone for debit locations and only hit the, the credit locations? Spot on. Good, good human factors practicing on hey. your part, man. Kudos. A plus. Did now, they did they mention any sort of other applications like I just brought up with the maintenance, or or was the uh, was the tourist the only type of example that they gave? No, I, I'm glad. I'm really glad you actually said that because my next thing I was going to talk about is something that they that they worked on, which is called Civic Blocks, which is 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 not exactly what you were talking about, but but similar which is what they were trying to do is they were trying to find, they were trying to get communities to fund projects around the city um, and uh, giving, the, giving the community the ability to fund what project they wanted to go in that particular space. So let me give you an example of, there might be an undeveloped location um, in this in this particular neighborhood, right? And it's it's run down. Um, there's nothing there. It's it's open land. It's city land, and they don't know what to do with it. So what they were what they were um, saying is that what if you gave the opportunity for basically a an opportunity for the community to donate their funds and choose what they wanted. Uh, to go into that location. So does a community want a park? Do they want a, um, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a, a rail station? Do they want, I mean, right. you, you can imagine the, the possibilities. And a so monument you, you leave or, it up to the, you leave it up to the, the community to decide what they want. And based on the funding that they receive, once they hit that threshold to, to build that particular uh, project, then it gets implemented. Yeah, that's a so. Is this a? Go ahead, Blake. So is this again like earning funds through kind of like a I don't know, kind of like a gamification of walking around or visiting the town, or how is this really, or is it only the voting system you're kind of talking about? Like they they're able to you know create some kind of vote for a park versus a rail station. Yeah. So so this was not. Yeah, this definitely isn't about earning. This is about um, giving. Really, so it's about it's about um, uh, it's getting like, on this site and and voting, but also giving the funds to it too. So you're not only saying yes, I support this, but here's also my contribution to make this happen. And basically, what they had is they ha- they had um, uh, bar charts of saying it's going to cost you know X amount of dollars to make this happen. And every time someone uh, donates money, that goes up. And until the first one reaches 100% completion, now one project could take a million dollars, one could take fifty thousand dollars. And that's the beauty of it: is if the one that takes that cost that takes a million dollars to get, but is raised first, the one that only took fifty thousand dollars isn't going to get implemented. So yeah. It, so- Maybe I'm missing missing the connection here. Is this still dealing with some of the more blockchain s technology, or is this almost like a Kickstarter for public projects? So, so it is in a sense that, but it's also still using the smart contracts 
um, gotcha. uh, concept. And so they, they didn't quite get into, and, and I didn't quite understand it. So I, I, I definitely uh, made a note to look into the uh, paper that they had um, for this. But um, I, I think what they do is they, they still have like the kind of smart contracts, which is, you know, once I, once this contract receives so much funding, implement it and refuse all other all other funding options kind of thing, mm. um, which I think is the the route that they took. That's interesting. Hey, Woodrow, uh, I got a quick question for you. How many more things do you have to cover from day two? Are, are we looking at about halfway done with day two? No, no, no. I, I got two other things to, to talk about, um, and then I'm good. All right, so let's go ahead and get to those. Uh, we're running a little bit long. I was thinking maybe we could wrap up the rest of them in, in a episode tomorrow, so that way we could talk about the rest of day two and three. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I can I can uh, finish really quickly with these other ones, um, if that's all right. All right, sure. And then if our listeners have any questions, we can follow up in the Slack. So okay, what what was next? Um. So so the other one is so these last two relate to privacy. And um, so one of them was obscuring images to enhance privacy. Um, And that was basically looking at how to, uh, what kind of extra information in images um, could be kind of sensitive that you don't realize that you're giving away, Um, which I thought was really interesting. And what they did was that they, they use a kind of research project to show what kinds of uh, 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 obscuring technologies could you use um, to enhance your privacy, but still get the message across. This is like so taking one the, this is like taking a selfie with a street sign in the background, right? Yes, okay. exactly. And and how you deal with that street sign, right? But it's not only a street sign; it's also the McDonald's on the monument? corner. Yeah, is there a monument behind you, right? Um, and so it's kind of that information, which is um, how do you actually obscure that kind of extra information do you blur it out do you completely um uh obscure it and uh you know block it off and then also what level of of obscu- uh um of granularity do you use for your like blurring technique um hmm. and and it was just really interesting to see because the whole idea was you want to retain the photos um original intent as much as possible while still trying to um kind of uh keep this privacy kind of sensitivity um uh to it while still being able to convey the real original message which you had um and and it was just really interesting because of the amount of pictures taken and how much is shared publicly um without people realizing uh the um Unintended consequences, I guess. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, or even thinking about like taking pictures from webcams, and like right now, I know the listeners won't see this, but I'm looking at Nick, and, and I can see a glare in his glasses. If what if you could, because you with Photoshop enhance. and just photo <laughs> enhancing software, let's say he was looking at something that was, you know, his bank account or whatever, and I was able to zoom in and look in his glasses and take that out. I mean, that kind of information you <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Uh, I see a blue screen. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I can't. <laughs> Listeners will never know what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> can be our little secret. Blake, uh, Blake, that is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and, and it's things like that that you just don't realize. Like the background of, of someone taking a picture and your computer is open and you yeah. have something up there, right? Which is like, um, y- you might not realize it, but it might be some sort of, it might be, ESPN. Well, then people will know that you're a sports fan if, if you have ESPN up or something, and then they might be able to figure out, you know what I mean? And so it's just, it, it might seem harmless, but you can think of, of some of the implications that this really could um, uh, bring about. Oh, yeah. I can see like a wide variety of just security enhancing abilities this kind of obscuring technology would have i'm sure the granularity part is the biggest difficulty though like where do you where do you stop the buck and how do you know if somebody wants it or not that kind of good stuff like on instagram versus like a a webcam photo i don't know yeah and uh, especially in like department of defense contractors that kind of thing they take training on how not to 
uh, present some personal identifying information, right? So that way people don't get a sense of who you are and, and what kind of things you like and what kind of clues you can have for your password and just anything you can think of. There's training on this, right? And so uh, programs to help, you know, protect the <laughs> protect the stupid user for a lack of better terms, <laughs> right? Like, because I mean, it happens, right? Or, or just negligent, right? It, it happens. Well, no, I, I, I'm laughing because there was an incident that happened not too long ago where someone posted on Facebook, I believe, or Instagram, um, who was a soldier who posted a selfie. Right. Um, and in the background was the plans for a secret mission that was supposed to happen on the table behind them that got out. And they ended up having to cancel the whole mission. Uh, because of one because, selfie. Yes, because of a selfie. And it just it, it just blew my mind that they didn't even think about, obviously, this is most likely a secured space. And so even taking a picture itself is probably prohibited anyways. And so even to like think about doing that is just beyond comprehension. But it, it just brings to mind how easy it is to forget. Right. Okay, you said you had one more thing. Yes, and I promise this will be short too. Okay, um, I hope so. We'll see. I'm not trying um, to rush us. I just we're. I know our listeners uh, sometimes an hour is a pretty good length. We're at an hour ten. I just want to make sure yeah. that we you know devote enough time to everything. And but go ahead. Yeah, maybe maybe what we can do is we can break them up into two segments. Do a little half hour segments, forty minute segments, and do day one, day two. Um, uh, that's all I'm saying. Um, uh, anyways, we'll I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you do your editorial thing and 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 just get on with my thing. We'll just um, leave it. We'll have the longest Human Factors Cast episode ever. Yes, and you're a part of it. Yes. Nice. <laughs> all um, right. So this last thing. So, so uh, this last thing is um, it was called balancing privacy and information disclosure in interactive record Lincoln linkage with visual masking. That's a mouthful. So, yeah, it is. Let me break this down into layman's terms. Basically, if you have information from two different sources, how can you link those those people within the different uh, the different sources to make sure that they're the same people? And how much information can you mask from that and still uh, get an accurate um, representation and uh, be able to link the the people appropriately? This is like uh, connecting two different social media sites, but also masking the information that's involved on those two social media sites so that way uh, there's a clear divide. Yes, exactly. So it's creating, it's, it's taking two, infor- two, two databases basically and combining them um, and uh, linking the ones that are similar or that are, that are the exact same so that you still have uh, one uniform data set. Um, with no duplication. So, so what was really interesting about this um, is that uh, there's a lot of information. If they're the exact same information, obviously you don't need to show the user, right? I mean, if, it, if the, the dir- birthdays match up exactly, you don't need to show the birthdays. If, if the, the date of birth or the, the location of birth is the exact same, you don't need to show that. You just need to show them that, the yes, it's correct. It's the exact same. Right. So what was interesting, though, is that um, masking uh, the data completely um, with only showing, with replacing the information that was different, um, uh, but showing it in a way that um, showed that there was a difference, um, only led to, uh, what was it, a 10% accuracy drop in under, in being able to accurately uh link those two people and and let me explain this because i know it's kind of hard to understand but the way i explained it i'm sorry but basically take this if if someone's name is the exact same but one character different then they would show basically all the characters um but in using symbols instead and then one symbol being different from the other and so it, it, it's a very different way of thinking about hmm. this, but it's it's like instead of instead of typing out the word Matthew, they they use the the symbols like the at symbol, right? Right. Except for, except for one letter at the very end, 
which they they differentiate with a different symbol like a an exclamation rate. point. Yeah. Right? So you know that that all the letters are the same except for the very last one. So most likely that's probably just a typographical error, someone a data input error, right? And so um, what they what they did is they did different levels of uh, um, m uh, masking, basically. So either you left it completely open, 100%, there was no masking whatsoever, you saw all the information. They did 100%, they did 30%, they did 5%, and they did 0% masking. So basically where you saw absolutely nothing. Even when they masked 30, uh, and you only got 30% of the information left, there was absolutely no difference between seeing all the information and only 30% of the information. Oh, wow. That's quite a big uh, effect. Exactly. And, and, but what was more impressive, which I probably shouldn't have led with this, so that's my bad. I got too excited. <laughs> but okay, when, they, when, they, when they completely masked it, when they give you 0% of the information, there was still only uh, a 10% a drop in accuracy. Of of getting the correct um, match with those uh, with those records, and and that accuracy actually just to let you know was seventy five percent of the time they were still able to accurately link those two um, those two records together with, without having any without sharing any of the data they were able to match these things up only using uh, discrepancies in symbols and all that. Yes, that's crazy. I, I like nerd out about database stuff and and especially yeah. linking databases together. This is like a, a nerdy thing that I like, so this is super <laughs> exciting to me. Yeah, and, and 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 you know, it's it's like one of those things that's it's I feel like is 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 very I don't know. It's not it's not sexy, right? It's it's for most people, it's not going to be like oh my god, it's going to make headlines. But for people like us, like you and me. I feel like this has huge implications of, of privacy, of thinking about you, you do not need to share all my information. You don't need to share my, my name, my date of birth, uh, my location, anything like that. You can literally give them symbols and you can still have a 75% chance of them being able to accurately uh, link our records together between databases and still use it as, um, as one. That's crazy. Yeah, that, All right, go ahead, Blake. That, cr that just creates like such an amazing safety mechanism for because every time you like render something on a web page, I mean, you're basically surrendering a lot of data every time you fill in a form that or give out your email address. But being able to share that across different databases in this kind of way, it, it, you're right. It could definitely limit the amount of times that you're either giving it out or. Also, the other implication here, I feel like, is if you're looking at databases and trying to do quick analysis to make everything make sure that everything matches just having these kind of cues would be a lot easier than trying to go text by text across like two databases yeah and these were these were also done i will just uh let everyone know these were done by non-experts um so you can only imagine That's someone incredible. who is an expert at this who does this on a daily basis that that accuracy percentage is guaranteed to go up they they've seen certain uh, instances before in the past. They know how to understand it, and the the whole issue with inferencing, um, you know, and and everything like that, just just really helps ease your mind when you hear uh, of uh, things like this. All right, well, Woodrow, it sounds like you had a pretty packed couple days there over at uh, Kai. Any other closing thoughts? Uh, stay tuned. There's going to be more to come. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for joining us for our longest episode of Human Factors Cast ever. It was a good one. We had a great bonus episode. Thank you so much to Woodrow Gustafson for joining us and breaking down everything from Kai. What did you guys think of our coverage? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Did you see something interesting out there at Kai? that uh, we didn't cover on the show, let us know. You can follow us all over social media. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. 
Be sure to join the discussion on our SoundCloud, or you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you see something interesting out there on the floor, leave us a voicemail the old-fashioned way at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Might have some exclusive interviews coming that way. Uh, if, you, if you're able to do that. Uh, if not, be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my panel for being here on the show today. Woodrow Gustafson, where can our listeners find you if they want to talk about that adorable Kai teddy bear you are throwing in our faces? <laughs> uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. And our Slack, right? Yeah. Ask him questions. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners find you? You guys can always find me in the Slack, but you can find me across social media at Don't Panic UX. Excellent. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends. It depends.